Okay, guys, let's start our next talk uh, with Sean Nangle here. So I'll give him a, a big applause, please. Okay, uh, everybody hear me okay? Good to go? Cool. Um, so speaking today on operational security lessons from the dark web, um, a few kind of mandatory disclaimers before we proceed. Um, the usual views and materials presented here do not represent any of my employers past, present, or maybe future. Um, I'm gonna be talking about a number of dark web related criminal cases. Um, I'm not discussing uh, guilt or innocence. Um, what I'm going to be discussing is evidence that was provided and um, what operational security mistakes that outlines and how to apply it for other um, enterprises. Also not going to be really discussing much the topic of parallel construction. Um, for anybody that doesn't know, parallel construction is a um, practice used by law enforcement where if they are either unwilling or un unable to divulge how information was gathered, um, say, by NSA surveillance, that sort of thing, they will essentially construct a parallel explanation that will be presented in court as to how the uh, information was gathered. A uh, little bit about myself. Um, about uh, 25 years in technology, um, shifted to security about 10 years ago, have done a wide range of public and private sector work, um, everything ranging from two-person software startups up to uh, multinationals. Um, currently working in the DC area, and as you can see, I have the cutest dog in the world. Um, goals of this talk, um, as I mentioned a little bit, examine a number of criminal cases, um, what mistakes were made and um, how the lessons learned from those mistakes can be applied to um, non-criminal activities. Starting with probably the most high profile one and I won't go into kind of the, the build up to the case that much and that's the Dread Pirate Roberts Silk Road case. Um, mo been in the news a lot. Most people are probably familiar with, with the case at least at a high level. Um, Ross Ulbrich was um, arrested at a library in San Francisco um, while working on his laptop. Um, one of the primary security mistakes made there, um, he'd chosen to work at, at a library, use their Wi-Fi, makes sense. Um, he was sitting at his table with his back to the room. Um, couldn't see anybody come in, couldn't see what was going on. Um, the FBI agents that were there to arrest him um, thought they probably needed to make sure they could get his laptop before he could lock it. So they had a couple of FBI agents essentially fake getting into a screaming argument. Um, he, we'd all do this, you know, looked up from his laptop, looked around. There was someone standing almost right behind him before he knew it. Laptops in their hands. They take it back. They image the laptop. Um, he had encrypted the drive on the laptop, um, which would have helped if he'd been able to keep the FBI from getting to it um, before locking in. Um, one of the things he was um, accused of was ordering, it was either five or six um, murders. Um, at least one, all of those were arranged um, through relatively anonymous means. Um, at least one of the quote unquote hitmen um, turned out to be a DEA agent. Um, I'll actually talk about him later. Um, in that instance, they actually faked the murder of the person in question. Um, to the best of everyone's knowledge, no murders actually occurred. Payments were made, but no murders actually occurred. Um, there's an old uh, New Yorker cartoon that probably everyone has seen that says, uh, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. Um, after this, I'm considering there should be one that says, on the internet, no one knows you're not actually a hitman. Um, so FBI was able to successfully image his laptop. Um, he had copious documentations, documentation on Silk Road activities on the laptop. He had a, a 
personal journal on the laptop spanning many years, um, detailed his plans for Silk Road, detailed activities on Silk Road, um, also had um, a large volume of chat logs between him and other administrators on Silk Road that were stored on his laptop completely unencrypted. Um, interestingly enough, in the very early days of Silk Road, um, he made a, a post, I don't remember where it was, um, using the handle Altoid, um, basically saying, hey, has anybody heard of this Silk Road thing? I think it's pretty nifty. Um, kind of, I guess, very early guerrilla marketing of, of Silk Road. Um, he then later on needed some, some pretty basic um, coding um, assistance, posted to, I think it was Stack Exchange, site like that, um, under the same handle, but whatever board he was posting on to ask for programming advice um, automatically made public the uh, email address that you had registered the account under. His email address that he used to register the account in that case was rossalbrick at gmail.com. Um, some of the initial suspicion around him actually had very little to do with Silk Road itself. He ordered, uh, I think, nine fake IDs um, from a shipper in Canada. Um, very high quality fake IDs. They were shipped. The package set off some sort of alarm bells for Customs and Border Protection. Um, they opened the package. They discovered what was inside. He had requested that it be shipped directly to the house he was living in in San Francisco. Um, they showed up, knocked on his door, said, we'd like to have a little chat with you. Um, weren't there to arrest him, just wanted to have a little chat. He said, no, absolutely not. Slammed the door in, his, in their faces, which is entirely his right to do, um, but maybe shouldn't have had the IDs shipped to his, to his home. Um, I mentioned earlier I wasn't going to talk about parallel construction. I'm going to make myself a liar for a moment and talk about parallel construction a little bit. Um, one of the things the, the law enforcement agencies investigating needed to do was try to find the actual servers in question. Um, one of the backend servers they were trying to find turned out to be in Iceland. Um, the official story on how that was found was that um, that server was misconfigured, so everything was served via Tor except the CAPTCHA on the login screen, which was transmitted over regular internet. Um, Rob Graham has a really good analysis of that, points out why it's actually likely that probably wasn't what happened, but um, the thing he does point out is through analysis of the evidence the US government um, released, um, the server in question was horribly and securely um, configured. Uh, his theory, which makes sense to me, is that the server was actually found through um, widespread internet scanning by the NSA, um, looking for a couple of things that could link this server back to, um, back to Silk Road. Um, the server was allowing regular internet traffic. It just wasn't necessarily through the, um, through the, the uh, serving of the CAPTCHA. So um, some lessons learned from this case, um, configure systems securely. Um, don't, if, if you're doing sensitive work um, and you need for whatever reason to hide what you're doing, um, don't reuse your personal identifiers. Um, if you need to ship something sec securely, um, think about using a mail drop, something like that. Don't have it sent to your home. Um, also don't send it from your home, which I'll get into a little bit later in one of the additional cases. Um, know who to trust. Now this is a very difficult problem when you're dealing with an environment where people are um, at least somewhat anonymous. I mean, how do you find, well, I guess the question of how do you find a hitman you can trust, period, is a big one. But how do you find a hitman you can trust when you can't do you ask for references for a hitman? I don't know. But how do you find a hitman you can trust when anybody can claim to be a hitman and you have no way of knowing if they are or not? Um, this obviously goes a lot deeper than just hiring people to assassinate other people. But um, be aware of your surroundings. As I said, um, if you're in a potentially host physically hostile environment, don't sit with your back to the room. Um, 
and also if something, I mean, if, if there is a commotion and you need to look up, shut your laptop. Um, and if you're doing sensitive work as much as possible, don't document your activities. Um, you're just providing basically free information for whoever your adversary is, be it a nation state, whatever. Um, next case I wanted to look at um, is called uh, some that went under the, well, several aliases. Uh, primary alias was Willie Clock. Um, young gentleman in Uganda, uh, uh, legal name Ryan Gustafson, um, had a pretty successful counterfeiting operation, um, which was discovered after someone was found um, trying to buy a $3.85, I think, cup of coffee with a counterfeit $100 bill in Pittsburgh. Um, managed to trace back, they thought it was to Uganda, not sure who it was coming from. Um, he, again, we see this a lot, um, reused e personal email address. Um, for one reason or another, I still don't understand why, his Jack Farrell alias, he set up a pretty full-fledged Facebook page for. Um, the email address he used for that was the same email he used for his passport application for a legitimate US passport. Um, in, in addition, he put, he put a profile picture on this fake Facebook um, page. Okay. You know, makes sense if you're creating a Facebook page, you want to make it look as realistic as possible. Um, but he used a photo of himself that they were able to match via facial recognition to his uh, state of Texas driver's license. Um, I have two issues here. If you're doing something like this, why are you creating a Facebook profile for your alias? And given that you probably will never be meeting people in person under that name, if you have to to make it look like a convincing person, just pick a random photo of somebody. Um, so again, we have the don't reuse identifiers issues. And if you're trying to set up a cover identity, for the love of God, don't use your real photo. Um, this kind of now loops back to the Silk Road case. Um, this, uh, appropriately enough, the fake hitman who turned out to be a DEA agent um, was incredibly corrupt, among other things, ended up stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, went under the, he was in contact with Dread Pirate Roberts under the uh, alias Knob. That was a legitimate part of the investigation. He also, however, created two additional um, handles to communicate with Ross Ulbrich, French made and then one called uh, Death From Above. Um, neither, neither the French made or Death From Above um, handles were, were part of the official investigation that weren't endorsed by the, the people running the um, multi-agency investigation. Um, he communicated um, as both French made and death from above using his DEA work laptop. Not only that, using his DEA work laptop that was set up because it was being used for the endorsed communication as knob, it was set up to log everything. Um, so they have literal full video recordings of all of his communication, um, pretending to be a hitman, trying to extort money out of him, so on and so forth. Um, as I mentioned, he ended up um, attempting to abscond with a pretty large amount of money. Um, he transferred all of that into bank accounts that were um, in, let's just say, locations with not super strict banking secrecy laws, and he set them up in his own legal name um, with his full legitimate contact information, home address, phone number, you name it. Um, so again, we, we kind of keep coming back to things around segregating your activities, whether it's don't reuse identifiers or um, don't, use, don't use a device that you know full well is going to be monitored um, to conduct sensitive operations. Um, additionally, um, if you're needing to 
communicate with someone and you don't want it traced back to you, consider the use of aliases. Although, once again, maybe don't use your personal photograph if you're creating a, a, a social media presence for that. Um, next case I want to talk about is uh, Shiny Flakes. This was a pretty large-scale drug trafficking operation based out of Germany. Um, it's run by a 20-year-old actually out of his childhood bedroom. Um, when the police arrested him, they confiscated about uh, 48,000 euros in cash, 320 kilograms of various drugs, and reportedly, all this is somewhat debated, um, about 325,000 euros in Bitcoin. Um, that then led to 38 additional raids um, following that arrest. Um, he's since been, been convicted. Um, one of the big mistakes that he made was almost every single shipment of drugs he sent was sent from the exact same DHL uh, package station. Uh, it was DHL package station 145, um, relatively close to his home. Uh, it was in a location that was under um, ongoing CCTV surveillance. Um, once they figured that these were, that's where the packages were coming from, narrowed down immediately um, what, what sort of area they needed to look in. Um, the other mistake that was made was uh, encryption or actually complete and total lack thereof. Um, he stored all of the information about customer transactions, plans for what he was doing, all that information um, in an unencrypted format on an unencrypted hard drive on his laptop. Um, again, kind of linking back to um, Silk Road, he also had all of his plans for his activities, um, as well as an unencrypted list of all of his logins and passwords for um, all of the various selling platforms he was using, all that sort of information. So lessons learned. Um, if you're shipping something sensitive, um, if you're, for instance, a whistleblower um, and you need to send a large volume of paper documents to a reporter, um, maybe split those up into multiple shipments and scatter where you're sending them from. Um, encrypt your data. And again, for the love of God, don't document your activities. Um, very recent case was uh, Alphabay, which kind of became one of the um, successors of Silk Road. Um, that and pretty much dominated the marketplace, um, mostly in the area of um, selling and purchasing illicit substances following the shutdown of, of Silk Road. Um, servers for that were located in Quebec. Um, the alleged administrator uh, was living in Thailand. Um, I say alleged because um, there was very good evidence against him. Uh, he chose to take his own life um, while awaiting extradition to the U.S. Um, that was shut down in uh, this month, I think July 4th of this year. Um, at its peak, they estimated that Alpha Bay was making between $600,000 and $800,000 U.S. in revenue. Um, again, um, welcome messages and password reset messages for Alphabay were sent um, using the administrator's Hotmail account, which was, I think, his, his name was Alex. I think the uh, email address was pimpalexnumericstring at hotmail.com, um, which he also used for lots of other personal communication, that sort of stuff. Um, again, lesson learned, segregate your activities and your communications method if you're doing, performing some sort of sensitive acti activity. Um, one last case that I wanted to talk about, um, and this um, was a number of years ago. It's a little different in that it's not, um, it's not actually a, a dark web case. Um, this was all, all performed on ClearNet. Um, the arrest was made in 2014. Uh, a gentleman from Russia by the name of uh, Roman Sel Selznev. Um, went under these various handles. What he would do is essentially when investigators got close, he would shut down operations, open up operations immediately on Carter forums um, under a new alias. Um, one of the ways that they initially started suspecting that it was the same person is he would start up under a new alias, 
on a Carter forum and immediately be elevated to the highest trust levels, um, which normally you, you wouldn't see in that sort of environment for a, for a new seller. Um, he was arrested in 2014, as I said. Um, he was on vacation in the Maldives, uh, found with a laptop with just under two million stolen credit cards on it. Um, he, so as I mentioned, the, the uh, sites that he ran for selling stolen credit cards were on the ClearNet. Uh, when he registered the domains for those, uh, he used his personal email address. Um, uh, most of the sites were served uh, from a server from a provider in um, McLean, Virginia. Um, he also used that server is basically his workstation. He did things like um, make travel plans, order tickets, um, order tickets transmitting his passport number, those sorts of things. Um, and again, uh, his, like we saw before, uh, laptop had um, a large volume of plain text passwords for his sites, that sort of thing, um, just stored unencrypted on the laptop. Um, again, I'm apparently just going to keep hammering this point until I'm done. Um, don't document your activities unless there's a really good reason for it. Um, and again, segregate your activities. If you're, using, um, if you're using a system for sensitive activities that you don't want traced back to you, um, maybe don't use it to buy airplane tickets for you and your wife to go on vacation. Um, the email address that he used for um, for registering the websites was also used for registering a PayPal account for himself and sending his wife flowers, which is a wonderful thing to do, but maybe use a different email address for that. Um, so, ooh, that ended a lot quicker than I expected. In conclusion, um, kind of a summary of the, the common lessons learned we see here are configure systems securely, um, know who to trust, which obviously in an anonymized environment is very difficult to do. Um, I don't have any solutions on that. If someone does, I would love to hear some ideas during the Q&A section. Um, always be aware of your surroundings. Um, don't document your activities, encrypt your data, and again, um, segregate your activities and, and communication methods. Questions? Comments? Can you? G'day. Uh, that last last case with the um, NCUX. Yeah. The, now you mentioned he got elevated to the highest level of trust automatically whenever he created a new account. Any idea on how that was done? Um, was someone knew who he the was the assumption is that he knew people on when he would set up a new identity on a Carter forum. He already knew people on those forums. Again, we're kind of. No, they did have established trust relationships. So um, typically how it works on a Carter forum is, is you register with a relatively low privilege account and until you can provide you know, X number of stolen credit cards or something like that, they're worried you might be a Fed. Yeah. So they're not going to give you access to everything. Um, so anytime, you know, I, my assumption is that he communicated with you know, administrators of the forum, said, hey, this is actually NCOX. And they said, okay, can you prove it? And he did whatever to prove it. And then they said, okay, we'll bump you up to the top. Cool. All right, thanks. Yep. In the case where he uh was shipping from one DHL station. Yeah. Uh, so would the recommendation just be to like drive out, use a different station? Well, each time? I, I think the recommendation is actually not only the, not just drive out to a remote location, but a number of remote locations. Um, you know, using the whistleblower example, because um, I mean, you're all free to do what you want to do, but I'm kind of focusing this on non-criminal enterprises. Using the whistleblower example, you know, you have ten reams of paper that you need to get to a reporter, maybe, and I'm just picking you know, a number at random, maybe split that into 10 separate shipments. Um, not necessarily drive to you know, 10 cities each 100 miles from you, but you know, a couple of different towns, maybe one a bit remote, that sort of thing. I 
I know for a number of these cases, um, correlation of like the timing of like when these users were active was one of the like um, factors that led to them being uh, uh, taken away and captured. So, what would you recommend for like defending against correlation attacks? And like, I know that like um, using like encrypted traffic in a public place is often suggested, but like. That can still be like monitoring and stuff. Yeah, it can be, and you know, I, this kind of touches on the, the whole parallel construction thing that I um, referenced earlier. Um, you know, the concern, obviously, depending on who you're worried about, is you know, do do you have a nation state attacker that is going to be able to easily break whatever transmission encryption you're using? Um, I think probably the best thing is, I, you know, I I go back to the Ross Ulbricht case and him being arrested at the library. I honestly think him working from the library was probably a pretty good idea. Um, him not being aware of his surroundings was one of the things that, that led to his conviction. Um, but going somewhere where you can essentially hide in plain sight along with a lot of other traffic, um, coffee shop, library, that sort of thing. And, but again, I mean, this kind of comes back to the, the uh, shipping issue. You know, if you always go to the same Starbucks that's two blocks from your house, um, yeah, you're going to be somewhat hidden in the other traffic occurring at the Starbucks, but it's not that difficult to go, okay, so we watch everybody at the Starbucks, and we think it's this guy, now what is, you know, what is he doing? Right, because if you're the only person on tour at that time. Right. Okay. So locations are very important. Yeah. Yeah, and mixing up the locations as a as I referenced. So you mentioned uh, segregation of activities. Uh, do you recommend uh, physical separation, for example? Always. Different computers? Different com entirely different computers. Different networks? And if, if possible, yes. But I mean, at the very least, different, very different computers, different logins, um, you know, different, use different email addresses. You know, I'm, almost every single one of these cases, one of the pivotal things was the reuse of a personal email address. I also heard someone saying uh, we, we should also set up separate uh, network access or uh, ISPs at home, even if you are using VPN. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's certainly some advantage in in that, although you do run the risk of. So now they see that there's. You know, at this location, there's basically two different traffic flows. They still know that one of them is whatever sensitive activity you're, you're performing. Um, again, I, I come back kind of to that hide in plain sight um, strategy. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much.